Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar for Doctors Returning to Work, brought to you by the Supported Return to Training team at Health Education England. My name is Amy Manicom and I am a Trainee Improvement Fellow at Health Education England, Thames Valley. Tonight's webinar will be focusing on all that is new in obstetrics and we are very fortunate to be joined by Mrs. Rebecca Black, who will be presenting. Mrs. Black is a consultant in obstetrics and fetal medicine at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford with a special interest in postgraduate medical education. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, stick to this. I will talk for about 40 minutes and then hopefully we will have some time um, for questions. So the first thing to say is thank you. Thank you for wanting to return to obstetrics or at the very least for stopping whatever it was you were doing and coming back to obstetrics. Um, I hope very much that you are made to feel very welcome um, by our maternity family. We are certainly very pleased to see you. Uh, if you are feeling a little bit um, anxious around the edges, then don't worry, uh, we all are. It is quite difficult to summarise the whole of obstetrics uh, in the next 40 minutes. So you'll have to forgive me. This is going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour through a few bits and pieces, which I hope that you will find uh, of some relevance. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about things on Labour Ward, a little bit about changes to common stuff. Uh, I'm going to mention COVID as I've been asked to and pregnancy, uh, some information and support for those of you who are returning to, to, to practice and then I'm going to talk a little bit about human factors. Um, The first thing to say is what has changed? Not all that much. You will recognise the labour ward that you left. Um, we're not into lasers, not very much is done laparoscopically and not much is done uh, robotically. Uh, we're still using forceps and von twos. We still do caesarean section through the same shape abdominal incision that we have done uh, for a while. So please don't worry. The other thing I would do is try and remember what's great. It is a fantastic specialty. And you should always remember that you are never ever on your own. There is always someone you can call. Certainly when you're on a labour ward you can always press the emergency buzzer and someone will almost always come. Uh, at the very least someone is on the end of a telephone and I'd like to think that you know modern day obstetrics is absolutely a team sport. You are never on your own. People work more effectively in teams I think than they ever did. So um, yeah please remember the Please remember the positives. So, things on labour ward. You're going to have to forgive me, um, but I'm going to start with the worst case scenario. Uh, that's because this is one of the most recent green top guidelines that the college produced back in December. Um, maternal claps. Maternal claps in particular, just want to talk briefly about maternal cardiac arrest. Um, what has changed? Well, we used to advise uh, patients in cardiac arrest needed to be tilted. Um, it was really important to tilt them between 15 and 30 degrees. That may still be appropriate if they are on a firm surface, such as on an operating table, um, but it may not be um, applicable uh, all the time. So the, the uh, advice now is to conduct what's called manual uterine displacement. You can either use one hand or two, and you basically shift the, the uterus over to the left-hand side. Um, so for those of you who've ever been on a MOE course, Mrs. what used to be called Mrs. Tilt has now become Mrs. Mud, um, manual uterine displacement. Uh, when should you do this? Any, any time beyond about 20, 22 weeks or any palpable uterus. The uterus is at the level of the umbilicus at about 20 weeks. If you do need to go on and perform a cesarean section, um, then the idea is that that should start uh, at least four minutes into commencing CPR and should be finished by five minutes of commencing CPR. The aim is not for the benefit of the baby, but the aim is to improve maternal survival. Um, 
you should have the available equipment. Uh, what you need is a scalpel and, and two clamps to cut the umbilical cord. The guideline goes on to talk about hemorrhage. Um, what's changed in hemorrhage? Well, we use an awful lot more tranexamic acid. This has come in over the last two or three years and is now a grade A recommendation that this significantly reduces mortality due to postpartum hemorrhage. It's given intravenously and it can be repeated, uh, not by you, it'll be the anaesthetist that, that gives a repeated dose. Um, Recombinant factor seven, certainly there was a phase when we used a lot of recombinant factor seven, but it is used much less now. And the current guidance that is in the context of amniotic fluid embolus, it should be only be used if coagulopathy can't be corrected by massive blood component replacement because it causes poorer outcomes in women with AFE. Moving on to other emergencies, so shoulder dystocia. Um, still happens. We've moved away from the mnemonics that we had before. Anyone remember the helper mnemonic and no one could ever remember all the bits that it stood for. Um, we've also tried to move away from eponyms, although we do still have the McRoberts manoeuvre, but we have abandoned Rubens and Rubens II and wood screw and reverse wood screw. Um, and we go with the uh, RCOG algorithm. Again, this is in a, within a green top guideline. I would mention that uh, you know, if you are stuck and this is an emergency, um, don't hesitate to ask the midwives. The labor ward coordinators um, these days are, you know, they are, have always have been uh, incredibly helpful and incredibly skillful. So if you are struggling with a shoulder dystocia, um, don't hesitate to get to ask for the labor ward coordinator or any experienced midwives help because they are brilliant at this. As I say, this is taken from the RCOG Green Top Guideline and there's also pictures of that demonstrate the McRoberts maneuver and suprapubic pressure and delivery of the posterior arm. Vaginal breach delivery, really just to mention in passing, uh, you absolutely need to find out what the policy is in your local unit. Um, in general, if you come across this in an emergency, my advice would be don't panic and don't touch. And quite honestly, that's it. Um, moving on to sepsis. Um, we have become better over the last few years in treating sepsis. Um, it is important to suspect you need a high diagnosis of uh, high uh, level of suspicion to be able to diagnose sepsis. Um, if you want to get the attention of an obstetrician and you say the word like words like shoulder dystocia, then they will often come running. But unfortunately, women presenting with sepsis will often do so in more subtle ways. Um, they're often hidden in side rooms or on postnatal wards or in assessment units where they get seen by the more junior members of staff. Um, what certainly helped is the introduction of, of early warning charts um, so that they can more um, accurately and more effectively uh, detect the deteriorating woman. But it is incredibly important um, to treat this promptly. There are sepsis tools out there. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the sepsis six. Most units will now have some form of sepsis tool. This one is taken from the UK Sepsis Trust, but most units have adapted uh, something like this for their own use. And really, I can't overemphasize the importance of familiarizing yourself with your local units guidance. Um, every unit in the country now will have guidelines on topics like these and more and you should be shown where they are and how to access them as part of your induction and reintroduction to the labour ward. If you are really struggling and, and can't find that then the prompt manual is um, extremely helpful and very well written. Um, many units now undertake the prompt course which is an, an annual multi-professional training day um, within their units. Right, I'm going to change, um, move on to to highlight just a few recent trials that it might be useful for you to be um, aware of. The first one is the PITCHES trial in the context of obstetric cholestasis. 
Um, there were two things that came out in the Lancet in 2019. One was a randomized control trial and one was a meta-analysis. So the meta-analysis um, is here. What they did was that they um, looked at the instance of adverse perinatal outcome uh, of women who had cholestasis. And what they showed was that if you have bile acids of less than 100, uh, which the vast majority of women with cholestasis have, then you can be quite optimistic and um, that the risk of stillbirth is similar to that of pregnant women in the, in the general population. The group also went on to perform a, a randomized control trial, and this is the PITCHES study, which was an RCT looking at the use of acidioxycholic acid in the context of cholestasis. Um, and what they found was that the use of Urso didn't lead to a reduction in adverse perinatal outcomes. However, they did comment that some women do get symptomatic relief from the use of acidioxycholic acid. So the current um, practice is to try it for a couple of weeks in women who are finding that they have troublesome symptoms of their cholestasis. Um, I understand that the college are currently updating their guideline with regard to cholestasis. Uh, so watch this space. Another trial that's changed our practice is the ANODE trial. This was a trial to look at whether giving antibiotics routinely to women undergoing any form of operative vaginal delivery uh, would be of benefit in reducing infection rates. And the answer to that was yes. So this has now been introduced into uh, everyday practice. So if you do do an instrumental delivery, uh, we routinely now give uh, a one-off dose of coamoxiclav intravenously because it, it, it improves outcomes um, and reduces infection rates. Another thing that's changed in our practice is the use of magnesium for women in delivering preterm. This is given for uh, fetal and neonatal cerebral neuroprotection. So if you give um, a, a baby being born preterm, uh, a if you give his or her mother a dose of intravenous magnesium, then you will reduce the risk of that baby getting cerebral palsy. So the advice now is as an absolute minimum to offer magnesium sulfate between 24 and 29 weeks and six days and to consider it between 30 and up to 34 weeks. After 30 weeks, the number needed to treat simply goes up. Um, the dose is uh, four grams, so that's the same as the eclampsia dose. So four grams intravenously with or without an infusion over the next 24 hours. Um, if the woman doesn't deliver, you can repeat this um, if she goes into threatened preterm labor uh, again. Something else that's, that's new in the context of preeclampsia um, uh, is something called the soluble fit uh, ratio. So uh, we now use this and it's coming into common practice. What on earth is a soluble fit ratio? Well, it's a ratio of uh, something called soluble fit in relation to something called placental growth factor. Now, these are two things that are both, both produced by the placenta. They're both produced in normal pregnancy. When you have a pregnancy that is affected by preeclampsia, you get an increase in anti-angiogenic factors of which one is soluble flit, whilst you get a reduction in the number of pro-angiogenic factors of which one is a pl a placental growth factor. So what happens is that the ratio of that goes up. Now there was a study known as the INSPIRE study, which looked at this and concluded that there is a, a very useful, clinically useful negative predictive value to this test. So if the test is normal, you can be reasonably confident uh, that that woman is not going to develop preeclampsia in the, within the next seven days. And that can be useful in management at the best of times, but it's particularly relevant at the moment when we're all trying very hard to keep women out of hospital rather than, rather than admit them. When it comes to hypertension in pregnancy, the most recent guidance comes from NICE, who published it in June last year. Um, this is all available on the NICE website, but they've got a couple of very useful tables, I think. This is for management of pregnancy with gestational hypertension. So the numbers 
um, these days are you would look to treat uh, anyone with blood pressure uh, persistently above 140 over, over 90 and you would aim for a blood pressure of around 135 over 85. Um, the things you would use are labetalol, bifedipine or methyl dopa as first line treatments, um, all of which have been around uh, for a while now. With regard to preeclampsia, again the numbers are similar. You would aim to treat if the blood pressure persistently remains above 140 over 90 and you would aim to deliver by 37 weeks at the latest. Just to signpost a few other recent green top guidelines um, over the last couple of years, um, placenta previa and placenta accreta, we're absolutely seeing more morbidly adherent um, uh, or abnormally invasive placentas. Uh, these need to have very careful planning for the, around the time of delivery and uh, the management of these is now being centralised. There are centres which spe specialise in this and centres that try very hard to detect this antenatally. If there is plenty of bleeding, then we tend to deliver them preterm. Even if they don't bleed, we try and deliver them by about 36 weeks. There's also a, a, a green top guideline about Vasa Previa. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you give these women steroids, you can detect it antenatally, although it's not routinely looked for at the time of the anomaly scan. You would give these women steroids and you would deliver them early. There was a new guideline around uh, managing women with obesity in pregnancy. Um, I think the new headlines were that all women with a BMI of over 30 should be given five milligrams as in high dose periconceptual folic acid as opposed to the usual advice of 400 micrograms and that women with a BMI of over 35 with one other at moderate risk factor or more i.e those who would be eligible for aspirin therapy should be given a dose of 150 milligrams rather than 75. And then finally there was a green top guideline about uh, preterm ruptured membranes that came out in the summer of last year um, what are the headlines from that one? We give people 10 days of erythromycin. We give people steroids. We give them magnesium sulfate as I've previously discussed. So you would not think about uh, tocalizing because of the risks of choriamnionitis. And we now, if there is no evidence of infection, would manage them expectantly until 37 weeks if all remains well. Uh, that's a change. We used to deliver them at around 34 weeks, so that has that has uh, moved up. So I've been asked to talk about uh, COVID-19. <coughs> I think probably the best current source of information um, for everything you need to know about COVID-19 and pregnancy is the RCOG website. Um, this is freely available. I've been on it today. Um, you don't need to be a member. You don't need to log in. You can just get access to this. And it's organized into these four main categories. This uh, is the main um, or the, the, one of the guidelines that it's it's been around for just under a month and we are already on to version six, which highlights the speed at which things are changing. So as I say, this is this is on the website. I am going to, I will whiz through it uh, quickly for you. With regard to women who get COVID, um, the advice is that women are no more likely than anyone who's not pregnant to contract con contract COVID-19. Most women who do get the illness will either have no symptoms or a very mild illness. Uh, but we do know from other viral illnesses that pregnant women may be at more risk of severe disease um, from viral illnesses. And in particular, this risk may be higher later in pregnancy, as in after 28 weeks. And it was for this reason that women were placed in a so-called vulnerable group by the government on the 16th of March. So that was before the general lockdown. Um, and so many of them have been on um, 
isolating and social distancing has been advised since then. With regard to the fetus, there is no current data to suggest that there is an increase in miscarriage or early pregnancy loss. There is no current evidence to suggest uh, that the virus is in any way teratogenic. There is some evidence of vertical transmission. Uh, so there have been, um, this has been confirmed, but what isn't known is what proportion of pregnancies are affected by this and of what significance this is to the neonate. Now, COVID-19 has caused a big change in the way that uh, women are managed, in particular antenatally, but also postnatally. Um, it has been emphasised that it is very important to continue with antenatal care. You know, antenatal care exists for a very good reason, uh, to protect the mother and the baby, and it's really important that we don't forget that and neglect that. Uh, so the advice is absolutely to continue with antenatal and postnatal uh, visits and contact with women. However, these should be done remotely wherever this is possible. If a woman develops symptoms of COVID-19, then those appointments should be deferred for seven days where possible. And for women who are self-isolating, these should be deferred for 14 days where possible. The other area where it's had an effect is that it is absolutely revolutionised um, visiting in hospitals. Um, so almost all units, uh, certainly our unit in Oxford, is now advising one birth partner in labour and that birth partner needs to be free of COVID symptoms. Uh, so pregnant women asked, are asked to are being asked to consider another choice of birth partner, another option of birth partner, if their um, current partner is showing signs of COVID. Uh, otherwise, there are no visitors. Um, so no one on the antenatal wards, no one on the postnatal on the postnatal wards. There is recognition within the guideline that this has the potential to affect um, maternal mental well-being and in fact there are a number of reasons why maternal mental health may be affected. Um, these include not just the virus itself and the illness, the potential illness itself, but the effects of social isolation, of uncertainty, of potential financial issues, of the amount of change that is going on, so changes in plans and changes in service provision and the speed with which that is happening is unprecedented. It's potentially particularly difficult for those women at risk of domestic violence or where there are safeguarding issues or whether there, is, uh, there are issues surrounding uh, substance misuse and these are particularly challenging. Um, for mothers, for families, for midwives, for staff. So what do we do, <coughs> excuse me, what do we do with women who are presenting, who do have possible um, COVID-19 infection and who we can't defer appointments for seven days? Well, we're advised to test for COVID-19 if women are admitted with clinical or radiological evidence of pneumonia or ARDS. And also if they have a fever above 37.8 and at least one of those symptoms, uh, acute persistent cough, hoarseness, nasal discharge and congestion, shortness of breath, sore throat, wheezing and sneezing. Um, anosmia has not been added as yet. I don't know if it will be in the future. There's also advice that uh, isolated fever should be investigated and treated according to the unit protocol. So if you have a woman with suspected sepsis, you're going to investigate that anyway. But if um, as part of the assessment, when you take a full blood count that you discover that the woman is lymphopenic, then you should send a test for COVID-19 as well. But again, the emphasis is on all units will have a protocol for this and it is really important to follow the local guideline. Um, I think this is the most beautiful um, assessment uh, advice about assessing and, and those presenting with COVID-19. It's taken from 
Dr. Charlie Freeze's um, talk last week and said thank you for letting me borrow the slide. I've put it in. I'm not going to go through it because she did so last week, but it is just there for reference. So it is emphasised that suspected COVID-19 should not delay administration of therapy that would normally be given. Um, there is potential for loss of situational awareness because we are also worried about COVID-19. So the example that the guidance gives is that you know, if someone has got a fever and they've got prolonged ruptured membranes and you would normally treat that with intravenous antibiotics, then it's incredibly important to still treat that with intravenous antibiotics. The other thing is when it comes to any obstetric emergency in someone who has is has suspected COVID-19, it is important that they are dealt with with by staff who are adequately protected. So in an emergency, these women need to be transferred to an isolation room. The people looking after them need to don their PPE and then they need to deal with an obstetric emergency. Now, when you go back onto the labour ward, you will be taught how to don and doff PPE. I won't go into details of that this evening, but you will be taught to don and doff. You will um, be made aware of what level one PPE and level two PPE both look like um, so that you will be appropriately protected. Interestingly, um, on the prompt website, uh, they have produced a, a, a newsletter with an update uh, about COVID-19. And uh, this was last, this one is from 10 days ago. And there is some feedback from people in Leeds who have been running obstetric emergency drills and testing out wearing PPE. And their observation was that it's our instinct to rush into an emergency to try and help the mother, to try and help the baby as fast as we possibly can without donning PPE properly. And this is not the current advice. What we need to do is learn and practice and get used to slowing down to make sure that the PPE is on correctly before we deal with the emergency. I thought the last piece of this was very interesting about um, people buddying up. So it is recognised that it is extremely difficult to don PPE um, by yourself. Um, but their observation was that if you have three people buddying up, prioritising the most senior person initially, that that is the fastest way to get one person ready to deal with the emergency. I think this is really interesting from a human factors point of view and I think this is something that we need to take back to our units and as we're practicing donning and doffing and emergencies and how we deal with them it's absolutely something to think about. With regard to place of birth uh, the guidance suggests that anybody, any woman with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 should be advised to deliver in hospital, even if they initially had planned to deliver at home on a birthing unit. There is some data from China to suggest that there may be an increased risk of fetal distress in labour, and so for that reason the advice is that uh, babies should be monitored uh, continuously and electronically during uh, during labour. A lot of in states, a lot of common sense stuff, so, such as minimising the number of staff entering the room during labour. Uh, asymptomatic birth partners may attend. The woman should be managed, um, and routine observations should be taken. But in addition, they should have hourly oxygen saturations. We don't advise changing the mode of birth <coughs> unless the woman's clinical di di uh, condition dictates otherwise. They do advise against a pool birth. An epidural is not contraindicated and indeed there may be um, reasons as to why you might want to use epidurals liberally. We can discuss that. 
there's no they state that no there isn't any evidence that entonox is an aerosol generating procedure and delayed cord clamping is still recommended so just to reinforce that the use of ppe personal protective equipment is uh, essential rather than optional um, there are different levels of it level one and level two uh, currently, we are using level one in most circumstances. Um, we are using level two when there is an aerosol generating procedure. I'm reluctant to be absolute about these because this is changing, just changing so rapidly. But uh, I'm, I'm cautious to, um, to make too many statements that may then change. I reiterate, your unit will have guidance on this. Postnatally, um, again in China, they did try uh, separating mothers and babies of mothers who, were, um, uh, who had COVID-19 um, for 14 days, but that's no longer considered the right thing to do. Um, and the current advice is that women and babies should be kept together. Um, breastfeeding is encouraged. Um, there hasn't been any evidence um, of COVID-19 uh, being found in breast milk. However, there is concern that if the mother, uh, that the mother uh, may spread uh, the COVID-19 to her baby through close contacts, which happens during breastfeeding. So sensible advice such as hand washing, avoiding coughing and sneezing of your baby, considering a face mask um, and um, obsessive cleaning of the breast pump. Going back to the RCOG guidance, there is uh, now, there has now been developed guidance um, on all sorts of aspects of uh, antenatal, postnatal care, fetal medicine. There's also guidance again that Charlie referred to last week um, on uh, managing uh, pregnant women with additional comorbidities, so maternal medicine um, and COVID. And there is advice about personal protective equipment, which uh, actually uh, has links to the uh, Public Health England website about this. Would also point out that if you're looking for more education and you're looking for more support um, and resources uh, and e-learning, there are e-learning modules about COVID-19 and pregnancy. So if you look here, this e-learning, it's what the RCOG used to call strategy and has now moved away and called RCOG e-learning modules. But what they've done is they've made uh, quite a lot of them um, uh, free to access for everybody at this time, um, including an infectious diseases tutorial and information about COVID-19 and pregnancy. They've also put in advice about returning to work. Now this is targeted at uh, more retired ONG professionals returning to practice um, during the pandemic, but it does have a lot of resources available and in particular I think uh, there is a whole list of um, recommended resources, which I think if you if you are worried or you think I need to, I, where do I make a start? I think this is probably as good a place to start as any. Um, I'll put that back up at the end if anyone wants to make a note, but it is available on the RCOG website. And then finally, I just want to touch on a uh, comment briefly on, on human factors. What do I mean by human factors? Well, we know that human factors are incredibly important in running uh, a labor ward um, in the modern era. The complexity of the care we are trying to deliver is challenging. And we know from things like Saving Babies Lives, which is a national project run for the RCOG, um, trying to reduce the incidence of, of bad outcomes in labour, that human factors are, are often a feature when things go wrong, particularly loss of things like situational awareness, uh, difficulty with decision making, difficulty with communication and teamwork and these things um, play, uh, play, uh, play a role in sometimes up to a third of cases. We have got a new environment uh, where people are doing things differently and people are distracted by the need to do things differently such as 
putting on PPE um, and, and dealing with new challenges. And there is no doubt that this has made our lives more challenging uh, rather, than, rather than less. Um, <coughs> we've got new people on our labour ward. We've got a lot of staff who are not at work at the moment, um, either because they're off sick or because they're not patient facing or because they are self-isolating. Uh, lots of people are walking around in face masks, which makes uh, communication more difficult. It is extremely difficult to have an effective conversation whilst wearing level two PPE. Um, I think it's really important that we are all aware of this um, and that we try. We have to make more of an effort um, to get on, to communicate. Um, to communicate effectively because these are challenging times. Maintenance of a helicopter, so-called helicopter view um, on labour ward is, is a way or a technique to try and retain situational awareness. There is a very good um, video again on the RCOG uh, website which I've put a link here. It's, it's an eight-minute video produced by um, guys at the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital which talks about situational awareness and how to try and get it back if you are losing it um, which I would thoroughly recommend if you haven't if you haven't seen it. So this is absolutely a time to try and look after yourself, try and look after each other and try and work as effectively as we possibly can in these challenging times. Um, so if you remember one thing try and remember this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca, um, for that really fantastic and informative presentation. Um, for those of us returning to clinical practice, it was really good to have an obstetric refresher and find out everything that's new in the world of obstetrics. Um, especially thank you for discussing the uh, Royal College guidance for COVID-19. Understandably, that's a really big concern for everyone at the moment. Um, so it was really good uh, to talk about that. Um, is it okay if I just ask you just a question, one question that's come up? Um, sure. Okay, perfect. Um, so it was regarding um, performing caesarean sections in patients with um, suspected or presumed COVID-19 infection. Are there any recommendations uh, regarding the thresholds as to when to perform a caesarean section in these patients, um, given that emergency management um, is going to take a little bit longer um, due to things like um, donning PPE and, and things like that? Sure. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a really interesting question. So uh, there is, if someone is, has, COVID-19 and someone is positive, then that is not an absolute indication to do a caesarean section. Um, however, does it, does it change on the ground how you might manage that woman? Um, it, it shouldn't do, but there needs to be a, an awareness that it is much more difficult to do things terribly quickly. Um, so if you need to do a category one caesarean section, that will be more challenging. And I think what you need on labour wards at this time are experienced people and experienced decision makers um, who are able to take that into account. We also absolutely need experienced anaesthetists um, who are able to help in this, in this situation. So um, no, it doesn't mean to say you have to do a cesarean section um, because someone is, is, is positive with CV19, but I think you need to bear in mind that it may be more challenging to do things um, terribly, terribly quickly. Okay, thank you. All right, well, so I think that that's all the questions that we have for this evening. Um, thank you so much for um, joining us this evening and for that um, fantastic presentation. We've also had um, uh, two other obstetricians, um, uh, Catherine Torbett and Lauren Green, who've been on our panel tonight and have been really great um, with answering some of the questions. So thank you um, all for joining us uh, for the presentation. Um, this, this was the only webinar for this evening, so um, before everybody signs off for the night, I just wanted to run through a few, um, a few slides um, and um, just highlight a few resources that we have available. 
If you enjoyed tonight's session, please do join us for um, other um, webinars that have taken place. We've got a jam-packed um, schedule of webinars, all of which can be found on the HEE events page. Um, when you leave the webinar this evening, um, you'll come to a feedback form. And if you fill out that feedback form, it will take you automatically to a booking link um, for tomorrow's webinar. Tomorrow, we actually have two fantastic sessions which are planned. At 2 p.m., we have a well-being webinar, which is entitled Take Care, Looking After Yourself so that you can look after others, which really promises to be an excellent session and very important for, for returning doctors at this time. At 7 p.m., we then have a clinical refresher, um, which is going to be covering emergencies in gastroenterology and hepatology with Dr. Tom Chapman, followed by um, arterial blood gas analysis with Dr. Tandip Mann. Uh, so please do join us for those. If you aren't able to attend on any of the webinars, um, all of them will be recorded and um, up on the HE website um, within about five days. Please do give us a few days um, just to assist with um, editing before the, the webinars are available online. If you are looking for any information um, and any support for doctors returning to practice, uh, this Facebook group, COVID Returning Doctors Support Facebook group, is a really a good resource. It's not uh, affiliated with Health Education England, but a lot of the panel members um, are um, members of the group and admins on the group, and um, there's some really interesting information on there. And um, there's also this resource, which is available as a Google document, uh, which, uh, um, con which has got a lot of really important and really helpful information for doctors who are returning to work at this time. Um, and that can be found at uh, bit.ly forward slash COVID dash returners. And that's a really, really helpful uh, web document. So thank you everybody for joining us uh, this evening. Um, please do fill in your feedback. It's really helpful for us in planning future sessions and also for our presenters um, to, hear their to hear the feedback as well. Thank you for joining us tonight and good night. <laughs>